So we've got in today a Commodore 16. I thought this one's worth doing a video on because you don't see many of these around. They're nowhere near as common as the Commodore 64s or VIC-20s. So this one's come in for basically a black screen. It doesn't seem to work. So we're going to dig into this and strip it down and see how we diagnose this. They're nice and easy to take apart. Just remove three screws here. Lift up gently. And then you want to disconnect the LED and the keyboard ribbon. And then you can set this aside. Remove all the screws you see around here. So there's just a bunch of screws you'll notice. And then the board should gently lift out like this. And then just watch this bracket will be loose. So just be careful of that. And with that, now we have the motherboard to work on. So where do we start with this when we're diagnosing black screen? Well, the first thing is I don't have an AB cable on me. So I'm just going to solder a 6RCA cable straight to this connector. I'm going to just take a ground from the big ground plane here. And composite is the inner leg on this connector right here. Or if you're looking through the front port, composite is this pin here. So I'm not bothered about audio for now. I'm just going to tack on the composite video signal. And obviously there's no need to do this if you simply have a cable. I just don't have one on me at the minute. So this is the quick solution. And now we want to take a look at powering this. So when there's black screen or when there's most diagnostics, I always like to power from the bench. But let's just first test the customer's power supply. So on that note, in order to test them, I've been sent these cool multimeters. We already sell quite a few. But this one has a few more features. It's a little bit cheaper, more readily available, and it has some non-contact AC mode as well. So I've got a few of these to give away. If you just leave a comment that you want one, or when you order from our website, if you just leave a note saying, please include free uh, Tesman multimeter, the first three people that leave that comment will get these for free, as they've been kind enough to send me three or four to give away. Got a nice user manual, comes in a nice case, and we have the leads here. These leads seem quite decent as well. So this is always my gripe with cheaper multimeters. If the probe leads feel hard, like not silicony, they can really get on my nerves. These feel quite nice. They're not premium premium, but they're certainly better than uh, most cheap meters. And this little multimeter itself. And there's the display on. So let's just slide this out the way a moment. Get the power supply. And let's have a go over this meter. I've not used it yet, so let's see how accurate this is. Plug the leads in. Now it's auto ranging, so you don't have to set anything. It's just automatic between uh, volts AC, volts DC, ohms, and continuity, which I presume means if you simply touch together, yep, it detects continuity. And you've got a little light as well. So it takes a little bit of time due to, I presume, auto ranging versus my fluke where you can touch on and get an instant response versus these meters it takes a while. But the fluke I'm using is 700 pound multimeter. So it's fairly obvious there's gonna be some things like that. But that delay isn't crazy, it's still usable. Now let's test the voltage. So we've got this here, which should be a positive outer, I believe. So probe on the outside, negative on the inside. 15.12 volts, that was nice and fast. So it detects voltage really quick. The minute you touch in, it detects voltage, which is good. So let's see how accurate that is. So it's 15.1 volts roughly, versus my fluke meter, where have I probe in here? You can see 15.043. So very, very close, 0 0.05 volt off true RMS. So that's really good to know. So we know the customer's power supply is good now. So let's continue the testing. Let's insert the power and turn on. And if we go to Retro6.wiki, Commodore 16 and schematics, we can see all the schematics here, as well as if we go to the power circuit, we can see how the power circuit works. So we can see on here, we have uh, the power connector that we've just seen. It goes through a line filter, through the power switch, through a fuse, to a regulator and out to the system. So let's just check that whole process. You can see here power comes in, goes through the choke to eliminate noise, through the power switch, and if it's switched on, through to the fuse. And then after that, once it flows through here, down to the switch, through the fuse, it goes to the input of the regulator, and the output should be five volts. 
So let's check that now. We have the DC plugged in. Let's now go for a ground here. And let's test this side of the choke. And you can see now it's plugged in. We're getting 10.96 volts. So I bet if we turn off, that rises up to the 15 volts. Yep, and you can see it's pretty much at the 15 volt range. So when you turn the system on, it loads the voltage down, which is common of these old brick power supplies with transformers in. Uh, they're inefficient and they over voltage as standard and just fall under load. So you can see here, we have 11 volts following through. We should have to the switch, which is 11 volts. The other side of the switch should have 11 volts, which it does. And if we turn off, just make sure the switch is working. You can see there's no voltage there. So when we turn on, we get through the switch, we get from the fuse, get to the other side of the fuse, get to the input, and then the output should now be five volts. And that's detecting as resistance because the problem is we have this giant resistor in line here, which I believe is just a way to discharge the capacitors once the system turns off. But that's actually interfering with our ability to measure voltage in this case. And you can actually see the test has blown the fuse. So I don't know whether this test has blown the fuse with how it's automatically selecting or not. We're going to have to just temporarily bridge this fuse. I'll swap it with another fuse once we confirm whether this was the issue or not. So let's bring back in the fluke that we know definitely works and will not cause a fuse to blow. Let's turn this on and measure. You can see we have an output of five volts and an input of 10 volts. So now so let's test with this multimeter again. We have an input of 10 volts and an output of five volts. So very luckily, I think that was just pure fluke. Maybe I even accidentally bridged these with the multimeter when I was testing, because that would have been a big fail for this multimeter if we couldn't measure voltage due to this big resistor. So, so far so good, we've blown a fuse, but I'm happy to just leave that one in for now. We get an output of five volts, so we know there's power to the system. So where do we look next? Well, we want to see what's on screen. And just while I'm here, just to do a little mini review of this uh, multimeter, you should see you've got a torch on the back that you can turn on. So you just hold the torch button to turn that on and off. There's a backlight, which just tapping turns on. There's no stand, so there's no kickstand with this, but it's small enough that you tend to just leave it flat on the surface and you can see from an angle, no problem, the screen doesn't fade. You've also got a non-voltage contact mode where if you remove the leads, I'll just quickly show you this, which is quite a cool feature. Say we were unsure whether this power supply is working or we're getting mains through here. You can hold the non-voltage contact button. It says non-contact voltage. And now all you have to do is hold this near things that have AC. And you can see it's detected that this mains lead does in fact have power going through it. So it's a really useful way of being able to test sealed mains voltage leads. So without having to open this up and detect whether voltage is getting through here, for example, if the fuse is blown in the plug, you can just do this and have confidence that there is mains voltage here going into this power supply. But we already know this power supply is working because we tested it with um, the DC mode. And let's now have a look on the screen what's happening. So if we turn the console on, we're getting absolutely nothing on screen. So let's try this. We have a diagnostics ROM here, which will show information on screen, even if almost everything on the system is bad except the voltage and the CPU. I've got it set up top for the Diag264 PAL ROM. And then if we turn on now, you can see the light comes on and absolutely nothing on the output. So there's very few things that can cause black screen. We've already checked that we have voltage out, so we know that's good. We can check for basic crystal, and then we're looking at probably CPU. So if we now go to the CPU section of the Commodore, you can see it is basically a 8501 CPU, which is a modified 6510, just with seven bits on the data ports. Here's all the pinouts, and common faults running too hot. These CPUs always run too hot regardless, so you definitely want to heat sink, and it's something I'll be installing for the customer after this video, regardless of what we fix. The CPU is one of those that gets really hot and definitely will die over time if we don't cool it. 
you'll see the symptoms are usually black screen of the CPU. And if the diagnostics run results in a black screen, then it's typically a CPU or power issue. In order to diagnose this, we need an oscilloscope. There's no way around this really. And what we're looking for, similar to Game Gears, is a faulty sort of CMOS gate inside the chip. You'll find that it floats sort of mid voltage range as opposed to pulsing like it should. So some examples of working signals versus like a broken signal. So it's time to crack out the oscilloscope. I'll grab my picoscope and this is a ground. It'll get a little bit warm when we turn on, but for how quick we're gonna be, I can just grip on this. And we wanna probe the CPU. Now the beauty of a lot of diagnostics is you don't need to worry about what's happening here. You don't need to understand how the CPU is working, what's coming out of the CPU. You're just looking for something that's irregular. So you can either compare that to a working console, or you can simply look, in this case, what we're going to look for is simple voltages not pulsing as they should. We know that this is a CPU, and we know these pins should nearly all be pulsing up and down. And if we look on the wiki, we can see that we have phase in, ready, interrupt, AEC, voltage, so voltage will be solid, address lines will probably all be pulsing, VCC is ground, address lines will pulse, the ports will pulse, the data will pulse, the reset will stay high, the read write should pulse. So we've got the scope up, we will turn on, and let's just start probing. So you can see there, we have the phase, and that's pulsing as expected. You can see you've got a nice signal, we'll go down, and there already we have a solid line, and a solid, which I wouldn't expect from read write. So straight away, these two pins are a little bit suspect. I wouldn't expect the ready and the interrupt request to be solid because that means nothing's running. So those two have suspect. Let's carry on. You've got pulsing now. You've got the VCC in. And you've got pulses for the addresses and datas. So these look good. These look good. All looking good. Oh, wait, no, that one doesn't. So that is, again, that is definitely a faulty uh, address line. That's a classic midway. You can see how it literally is sat around the 3 to 4 volts and not pulsing low. That should definitely be pulsing low. Another one there. And then back to good. So you can see that's not pulsing low. That one is. So they should be pulled low, the way the CMOS gates will work. That should be being pulled to ground, and it's not. So that could indicate a fault on the CPU, which is also... Eh, it's, it's probably about as hot as the CPU does get. It is hot, but all the CPUs run hot, as I mentioned. So it's not necessarily an indication there. But there's some definite faulty pins here. Now these pins obviously go down to the 4384 as well, so this could be faulty. But usually when you have the diagnostics ROM and you see nothing on screen, it's got to be pretty much power, crystal, or CPU. We've checked the power. Let's just quickly check that crystal. Yep, we have pulses on the crystal, so there's no issue there. And the fact that we get black screen, if you plug this into a normal TV, it goes from like blue screen to black. We know the general system to output onto the AV cable is working. My first suspicion now is going to be the CPU. And the beauty of this is they're already socketed, so all we've got to do is pop them out. To pop these out, just put a firm... Uh, this is the best tool I find. It's just a cheap... I don't even know what these are classed as. Pry tool, I guess. Just a firm pry tool. Slide in. Lift up gently. On both sides. This has never come out before because it's nice and crusty. And then once it's most way in the air, never yank up the chip. Instead, twist like this. So you've got a limited range and you can never accidentally flick up. So just twist. Go the other side. Twist. And there we go. That's a safe way to extract uh, the chip. Let me just go and quickly open up another Commodore 16 and get a known working CPU out of that. And here's one from one of the machines. I've got clearly written on U2 OK. So I normally take a working Commodore, swap chips around, run the tests, and once I know they're OK, I just write on them. So I can be assured this is definitely a working chip. Let's just pop this chip in here. And let's clip the oscilloscope back on. Turn the console on and probe again. Yes, there we go. Look at that. That's the ready and the interrupt. Now, I would have thought the interrupt would have done something, but the ready signal is now 
running. That wasn't running before. I think one of these down here, the address lines was bad. Yeah, and there you go, that's now running. So what we did see before as faulty pins seem to be running. I'm not 100% sure it's running because I'm sure this interrupt request... Ah, got the diagnostics chip in. One sec. Let me remove the diagnostics chip because with that in, I don't think the interrupts run. Let's try again. There you go. Interrupts are running without the diagnostics chip. So I am pretty confident, that was a nice easy fix, that this is going to run. So let's just plug, in fact, I don't even need to plug the diagnostics ROM in for now. Let's just try turning on the console. Yes, there we go. So we now have the Commodore Basic popping up. We can plug in the keyboard and run all those tests. But while we're here, let's just have a quick look at the diagnostics ROM. So you can see on this one, I have the option to select games as well. So you can quickly play a game without loading from cassette. Just using these toggle switches. Insert that in, turn on, and let's just show you what this test should look like. So as it first runs, it cycles through a bunch of screens. It will then test the high ROM, and then the kernel, and then a bunch of other things. So it's done the low RAM, it's done the high RAM, sorry, not the ROM. It's done the basic ROM, the kernel. It always skips the function low and high. I've never got them to run. The keyboard now, it's going to attempt to obviously test the keyboard, but I don't have the jigs plugged in, so this one will fail. The joysticks, I also don't have joysticks plugged in or the tool that bounces back the joystick buttons for confirmation. So that's going to fail as well. It's going to skip the user port because there isn't one from the RS-232. And then this is testing all the video RAM, which you can see is working. Testing the times two clock and the interrupts they passed. And the TED registers are tested you can see there we can press k or p to run further tests otherwise it starts the test again so let's just turn that off and we might as well validate that there's nothing else wrong so i'm going to use the diagnostics serial port block the cassette block and this allows loopbacks so that the ports can be tested i'm going to also plug in the keyboard loopback tester so we can test the keyboard and finally the joystick connector these are always really firm to insert and that's all the jigs in. So if we now turn back on and let the test run, this should run every single test and confirm that everything is working. So you can see it always skips them function tests I'm on about, but this time the keyboard and the joystick, cassette and serial have all instantly tested okay, which is a good sign. And now it's gonna run the usual VRAM tests. And you can see there a screen of everything successful and the test just starts over again. So with that all run, let's turn off and let's just flip this to run one of the games. And you can see that loads up. If we flip it to run the other game, that doesn't load. But then again, we have all these diagnostics ports still plugged in. Let's just remove these because we're not running test diagnostics. We don't want to leave all the ports in. So now with just the diagnostics ROM in, you can see that loads the game as well. So we've got the invaders there and we have Jack Attack there. So you now they're properly loading. So I'm happy this console's up and running. I'm gonna put a nice big heat sink on here to keep that cool. Otherwise this new chip's gonna die. I'm gonna replace the fuse for a new fuse, get it all tested, cleaned up and back to the customer. So that was a fairly easy repair. We got to the problem pretty much straight away, which was CPU. If the CPU wasn't the fault, this diagnostics cart would typically then highlight which other chips could be at fault. But once you've tested the power circuit and you know the CPU is good, these four chips just socket in and out. So typically if you have spares, you can put them in. But all of these chips on the board can be tested in the exact same way with the oscilloscope, just looking for those broken traces. Almost every fault will be found that way. Not always, but majority of them. And combining that with a diagnostics port, it should be fairly easy to diagnose and fix most Commodores. So hopefully that was at least useful for you guys. I know it was fairly brief and we found the problem pretty quick, but I hope you learned something. That's it for this one and I'll catch you in the next.